did receive an invitation from Cra Craven County. They're celebrating their 300th anniversary. And they're going to have a, a, an event on September 22nd from 10 to 2 at the convention center there at the riverfront. We'll have a more formal um, invitation in your weekly packet. You'll get in the mail this week. But if you would, um, please note that. Other than that, Madam Chairman, that's all I have. Okay. Um, and I don't, is Dr. Emery here? Okay. I don't see. Well, Actually, Commissioner Hammond passed me this um, note here to announce a Unity March to Stop Black on Black Violence and Homicides for Saturday, October 6th at 12 noon. Location will be the West Greenville Gym. Looks like it's being put on by the Benevolence Corps um, here in, in Greenville. So just want to. Okay. Um, we'll just pass that and I mean I know she's not we got her down for 945 so we might call her or text her or email her if you want to but we'll move on to Kiara Jones there she is on the ready thank you Good morning. Um, when I became the director of public information office in 2008, I wasn't aware of any awards that the office had won, so I made it a personal goal of mine for us to win at least five. Um, if you remember, <laughs> in 2011, I came before you to let you know that we won two Excellence in Communications Award from the NC3C North Carolina City and County Communicators Conference. And earlier this year, um, I'll let you know that we won two more. And I'm here. Um, that time, Commissioner Ward, you told me to bring back some national awards. So yes. I'm here to say that we have done that we want an um, <laughs> award of excellence from the city and county communications and marketing association and that is a national organization the first time that we uh, submitted and we actually won um, an award so I just wanted to let you guys know that um, it was for a program that we produced um, a meeting documentary on um, a called walk in my shoes and it uh, highlighted a Pitt County schools teacher and a former um, deputy county sheriffs who suffered with MS and actually helped promote the MS walk so I I want to publicly thank my public information specialist, Michael Emery, for doing such an excellent job on it and to let you guys know about the award. So thank you so much. Right. Congratulations. Okay, we can go to international next. But that's right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Kathy Booker, our tax collection report, please, if you'll come forward. Thank you. Um, the Pitt County year to date which is july and august 2012 we're just into it two months in the new year the combined collection rate for real and personal property and registered motor vehicles is 60.96 which is a which is an increase of 4.78 over last year's year to date combined collection rate of 56.18 that's it any questions Motion yes to accept might. the report Okay, we have a motion second. to accept and a second. Now, Mr. James? Yeah. Well, yes, uh, uh, we, give, we give a discount for those people who pay their taxes early. Right. Yes, that discount runs in July and August. And it ends July and August, so now it's too late for them to get yes, it now. Sir. Well, okay, I want that to bring that out. We probably ought to advertise that more. It's 2%. We, we actually we list do. on the, ta on the bill do. itself. We, we, we do. Yeah, yeah but you get them, you don't double. Mm. There's I important do. information oh, on there do. for the public, I especially look. on the back. It's it's packed full of important information for the public. And I knew that, but a lot of people just get them and they don't look at them. Yeah, we would I like for them to read the important. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting to note that when she appeared last month, we'd collected about five million dollars of the the total amount of taxes. Now it's up to almost forty one million dollars. So, the good number of people do take advantage of that two percent they discount do take and of the discount. get it in before the thirty first. Good. Okay, we have a motion uh, to accept the report. Can we vote, please? Are there are no more comments. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we'll go back up to, to Dr. Emery. And you're not late. We were just moving a little ahead. Thank you. Which is unusual. Congratulations. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's nice. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you're all doing well. And thank you for letting me run back and forth between meetings this morning. Um, I appreciate it. Um, welcome back to school. Uh, we start week three today, and we, we're really sort of pinching ourselves. Uh, we, you hate to say too much about how smooth and easy it's been because invariably something will happen, but uh, we didn't have any reassignment. We didn't change any bus routes, so it's amazing what happens when you 
have consistency over years um, how smooth a start to the school year we've had and we uh, owe a great debt of gratitude um, to our folks on the ground bus drivers folks at schools teachers everybody who helps prepare and um, make for a good opening to school uh, we are uh, running into day 10 uh, this week and that's a big day for us day 10 and 20 are big days for us because we look at whether we need to shift staff uh, from school to school some schools we know already have more kids show up than we plan for and others have less and so we don't have the luxury of just saying okay you hire a teacher we sometimes have to make some moves and so we're looking at those numbers and um, looking at what kind of moves we might have to make uh, we also are um, excited about the fact that we had two schools this year that did an early start. Um, we, you all have seen and we talked about race to the top dollars and some of our schools chose to use some of their race to the top dollars for extended learning time to bring their kindergarten class in early and Northwest and Belvoir brought children in early and they had a three week head start to the school year and that allows us to measure um, the 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 the, the uh, readiness of those students for kindergarten, and we know that it, it doesn't take a lot of time to help those kids get a little bit of a head start on kindergarten readiness. Um, we had any school in Pitt County last year that scored below 60 percent on their on their composite receive race to the top money for extended learning time and we got really good results from that whether that was extending their school day or having Saturday school or these summer programs uh, we know and, and really that follows what research says kids who are behind if they have more time um, we can accelerate their learning we're very excited about results from last year you all have probably seen all that in the paper but I do want to reiterate we saw another more than three percent jump in our graduation rate so in a three-year period we've gone from a 58 percent rate which was unacceptable to 73 and while we still have a ways to go we have a goal of 80 um, we're excited about the progress our schools have made um, and I also can't say enough we're extremely proud of Aiden Grifton High School and South Central High School who already are above that 80 percent rate this year so we congratulate them for the hard work and effort that they have have made we also um, had another above average um, this year that we have not had and that is that when we combined all of our schools that made growth or high growth um, we had more than 90 percent of our schools meet that goal and that was above the average in the state of North Carolina which was 80 percent and so we are thrilled um, to be making that progress uh, marching along the assessments that we have used for years, ABC Tools, which measures growth and high growth, um, will completely change this year. So our, our teachers and staff and students enter a school year not knowing what the assessments will look like in the spring or how we'll be rated or sorted on them. So there's a little bit of anxiety, as you might imagine, moving away from the familiarity of something they have had for 13 years into a complete unknown so um, we're trying to help our teachers know that if they teach the new common core and essential standards and those assessments are aligned to them then our students um, should should do well uh, we also uh, wanted to share with you that uh, this is the last year of our three high schools who had the school improvement grants from the federal government and we have moved away from uh, positions as people have left those positions those dollars have been moved into technology um, in fact our board approved um, this summer uh, a half a million dollar purchase of technology for those three high schools uh, for the upcoming school year and so um, in this last year of that grant the idea is sustainability and being sure that um, we're putting tools in the hands of students that um, help them and help their learning be accelerated one of the key positions from the grant that we will be challenged as a district to look to how we continue are the graduation coaches and in those three high schools those people have done a phenomenal job of getting out in communities and visiting families 
literally going and getting kids and getting them back to school, tracking their progress, tracking their transcripts. Um, it's surprising to see how many students get to be juniors and seniors and don't realize that if they make a few changes in their schedule, um, they might graduate on time. Uh, one of the programs we have going at Rose High, which was not a grant school, is called ACES, and they actually use some of their remediation money to hire folks to come in there, and they find they actually find a fairly decent volume of seniors who, if they manage their schedules right and pick up a few extra courses online, will graduate on time, and that's just from doing a very thorough look at their transcripts and working with the counseling department. Uh, the other exciting uh, program we're launching this year is at South Greenville Elementary School. Um, South Greenville becomes our first school to be an iPad school and we were able to find um, some support funds um, to make sure that every third through fifth grader will have individualized learning using that device and we know the device is not everything it's just another way to help them um, learn but we are quite surprised by even the little ones who know how to manage those devices better than the adults do. So um, our South Greenville staff spent a lot of time this summer training. They're very excited and um, the students, we're doing a special program at the end of the month where the students will each get their iPad and very ceremoniously so that they realize that we believe in them and we know that they um, can accelerate their achievement as well. Things are changing so quickly that we really do try to pilot these things in small places first to see what the bumps are and what, what the things are that are positive about impacting learning. So, The other uh, task we have ahead of us this year is looking at um, our schedule. The legislature last year mandated either five additional school days or additional hours. So we will be looking at, as a district, um, can we lengthen the day that we currently have and not add those five days or do we add two? And so we will be working on um, what will that look like for us and we're hoping to not add uh, the full five days if we can avoid that because of the cost of transportation which as of yet we don't know that we will have any funding for. So um, again I just want to say thank you to you all for your support of our school system. Uh, we know that we fare better. I hope you saw the article over the weekend about funding. We know that um, we have fared better than most during these difficult years because of your support. Um, we appreciate the partnership and the collaboration in tight times and helping us be creative about how we manage that. Um, we feel good about um, sort of the uptake here. Our teachers and state employees got a 1.2 percent uh, salary increase and um, I've had people of the, in the community say, oh they got a big raise and I've said, well most of our teachers already spent that 1.2 percent getting their classrooms ready for school to start back. It's not like that's a car payment or a, a, a house payment. Uh, but I think it is a good gesture and a sign that, that things are getting better. Uh, we also had more turnover this year. We hired 125 teachers, and those aren't new positions, of course, but that's the most hiring we've done in the last three summers. So we think that also means people are moving around a little bit and feeling a little more confident um, economically. So again, we thank you for your support, and whatever questions, I'll be happy to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hammond and then Mr. James. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Emory, where could you give me an update on the unitary status of the school, please, ma'am? Yes, sir. We are awaiting to hear from Judge Howard a date. Uh, you know, we were supposed to we are supposed to return to court in December, and because of the uh, Lake Forest issue and the appeal of the Fourth Circuit, which came back to Judge Howard, um, we ask him to put all of those issues together. Mm -hmm. the, the issue of Lake Forest and reassignment and the unitary status case. And we told him we would be prepared by October 1st. So we are at this point awaiting his date um, for us to return to court. And we hope we'll hear all of those things together. 
Okay, is that it? Do Mr. you Jay? have an application okay. for a charter school this year? No, sir. The district Thank did the district file an application. For, Pardon? Are you asking? Did the school district file an application for a charter school? Did any? I'm asking you. Did you receive an application? We we got copies of applications from entities in the community who file mm -hmm. because you know the law says they have to file a copy with us neither of those two entities got past the first round of the application process okay Ms. Damon, is that finished mr james um uh, i got a phone call from a parent in bethel saying that they are cheering they were taking up money to buy books and i saw that you on television referring to that but it kind of disturbed me so I said well and I pick up students every day at one at Palm I asked her I said do you have a book and she showed me a book social studies that she had got that day that was Thursday I believe or last week and I want to know why you didn't have it before when teachers are there and personnel is there before but then I went on and checked with them and I find that they are hundreds of students that don't have books. As a matter of fact, there are thousands who don't have books. And I was a classroom teacher for 35 years. It disturbed me very much because I know if you don't have books there for your student, your teacher, when well, the teacher's got books, I say that back, but the students don't. What in, somebody has got to do some extra work and a lot of extra work. I do know that of course, I think in three or four years, it's all be on computerized. I know that. But we're living today. These students are here today, and the teachers are here today. And it looks like to me that they, they need help, and they need it now. Uh, they, this particular parent wanted to know, doesn't the school have any money to buy books? I said, yeah, I'm sure they got money. I said, because books is one of the key things. If you don't have books to, have to teach these people, I don't see how a teacher can do it. So then I went on to quest teachers, and they said that a lot of times they're having to run their materials off to take it to be able to teach. And that is mighty hard to take and to do in this day and time. Do you have somebody in the county school system that's in charge of the books all right so therefore and i have some questions down here uh textbooks what percentage of students do you think in pitt county schools don't have books today now the teachers don't have books for those students to take and use there's no way i can answer that question mr james what i can tell you and it's the only answer and it's not one you're going to want to hear is that for three years straight the state of north carolina has given us zero dollars for textbooks the local money we have spent is to rebind you know we've got textbooks 8 10 12 years old and right. they get used year in and year out we've spent our local money just to rebind them or put covers on them to keep them together so we can keep using them but a lot of children do not have books particularly that they can take home because we need to keep them for classroom sets don't you believe that books are one of the most important things that you can have to educate these people that we have in schools today? Sir, with all due respect, the money for textbooks comes from the state of North Carolina. <laughs> but if, if they aren't going to give it, now I'm, I'm a tightwad. <laughs> okay, you know but, that. but a biology book but, costs $197. We're not talking about something that's 20 bucks that we can just pay out of local or school-based funds, Mr. James. Is These it are a expensive. state law that the state of North Carolina is supposed to furnish the students of North Carolina books for their education? Am I wrong? It well, used to I, be that. I think the General Assembly is, <laughs> is who made the decision not to fund the textbooks. Well, I, I think book, that yes, you're, the, I don't know whether it's a law, but books are it, the fiduciary responsibility of the state. That's right. Just like paying teachers, but it's county not. bills of buildings. But I, I, I really think that we, that this board and, and your board, we need to work together to do every what needs to be done. Because to me, as a classroom teacher, 
If I went in there and I didn't have a book or anything, that is, you're taking the most important tool that I've got to take and to teach. I mean, really. Well, I think Maybe I'm I crazy. Think I don't an, know. No, but I think it's another Ford, way you are, to... You are a principal. Didn't you want books? For your student. I want a book now. I like to read the newspaper, but but I do. But, I think, if I'm not mistaken, a long time not a long time ago, in fact, a little bit ago, the state of North Carolina had a textbook commission yeah, that hired lots of people that they distributed do. textbooks. We got new textbooks every four years. Then it got to every five. Then it got to every six. And then it got to where you got no new textbooks from the state of North right. Carolina and that's gone on for at least three years two. Well, this is well, the third year for my benefit if nobody else's I want this I'm a manager or whoever it needs to be to get in touch with the powers to be in Raleigh see who's responsible to get these books to help these students and these teachers out I really do and ever and if they won't do it that it's up to the duty of this board to take it and do something to make sure it's carried out. I really think we'll somebody sat down on a job and it needs to be done. And uh, that's all I got. And I'm not putting I'm not putting the blame on anybody. But I'm saying this: as a classroom teacher, you put me out there with that thirty head of youngins, and I don't even have a book for them. You put you put me behind the eight ball. I mean, really now, you get out there and you get that way and see what I'm talking about. And it's something that I didn't realize. I really did not. Nothing. I didn't realize that we didn't, that these teachers were going in these classrooms and did not have a book for those students. And it really, I said, man, somebody needs to take and get somebody riled up. And I'm a good one to start fussing Thank about you. it. Thank you. Okay. You're on the uh, right track. Thank you, Mr. James. All right, so, uh, we need to do something, though. We really do. Okay. I need to help them out. On. I have Mr. McLaughlin next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm proud to uh, note that our graduation rate has, has increased. Um, now, the, the, the dropout rate, uh, I, I know that we've done better in that area also, but comparative to the state average, how are we? We, this last year, and again, you know, the, the state is a year behind in reporting, so we won't get the official numbers for the 11-12 school year until January or February of 13. By our own calculations, and again, we can't see what the rest of the state does. Last year, we, we were only two points behind the state average and our feeling is as as nice a chunks as we were making that this would be our year 11 12 would be our year to hit that average or or get ourselves out from under that but we won't we won't know that we can look at our own numbers but we don't know what the rest of the state does until January of this year so you know our goal was 50 percent in five years uh, we have two years left, and we believe we're well on our way to meet that goal. And one of the uh, biggest concerns of mine, as you well know, I think you all you have been somewhat proactive in this area, is, is bullying. And bullying is, 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 as I see it, is a very uh, it's a national concern, and it's it, it seemingly it's getting worse and worse as the years pass. What are we doing to be proactive? in that area of bullying? Well, our Board of Education has has um, changed their policy in the last two years, so there's, you know, pretty much zero tolerance. There's a, there's a very strong position about that. We do training constantly with staff, with counselors. I would tell you our biggest um, issue with bullying and trying to have the kind of impact we need is knowing about it. And part of the challenge we face right now is the majority of bullying starts, believe it or not, in cyberspace. Um, texting, email, online is where a lot of this stuff begins. And so the good news about that is if people report it, there's a way to trace it and find it and sometimes catch the perpetrators of the crime, so to speak but a lot of times kids don't tell us or they don't tell their parents or anybody at school about something until it's weeks old and then it's really hard to go back and 
and recapture or find witnesses to that. So we encourage, we send letters at the beginning of the school year. We really have encouraged parents to please, as soon as your kids say something to you, please come to school and let us start to deal with the issues quickly and encourage students to let us know. Um, we still live in a world where we're concerned about bullying, but with, with kids, a lot of times they just don't want to tell somebody. And sometimes that's genuinely out of a fear. You know, if I tell on this person, it's going to get worse. And sometimes it's, it's just, it's not cool, you know, to tell somebody else. So um, a, lot of, a lot of effort goes on in our schools, everything from, you know, at some points that there's actually class changes that occur to separate kids. We've moved kids from schools if parents want to do that in order to alleviate an ongoing problem. But just last week, our, uh, our attorney, Mr. Sonnenberg, got a call from a parent who was concerned because their child was getting texts from somebody. What, what, what can the school do? And, you know, sometimes we really have to say to parents, you have the ability to control your child's cell phone. We, we can't, you know, we can't always manage that. So um, what we find is while a lot of this does manifest itself at school, it comes out in maybe a not so nice way at school. Nine times out of ten, these things are beginning with kids texting each other or Facebook or some kind of social media. Thank you. Before I rec piggybacking on the bullying thing, um, is there anything in the handbook, the disciplinary handbook, I know that's sent home every, about the process that, say, an administrator is supposed to follow if a report comes to them for bullying? I know that that was like almost a handbook which i really appreciated because if something happened on your campus or with your students you had a guideline of steps you had to follow it's almost like if you suspect any kind of abuse you have to report it you have to get something moving and i didn't know whether we had added any of that to the parent student teacher disciplinary handbook if not i think it would be a good thing to do to what steps should you follow if a report comes to you from a parent or a child? The code of conduct for administrators and what a parent should expect to happen mm -hmm. is there. The policy and procedure are more detailed than what's in the code of conduct, and those are online, so that's also another resource for parents. But just as, a re as an administrator, not so much as a parent, but if that call comes into an administrator, or to a teacher or to you know the step what do I do you know what do I do first second third that kind of thing I think it would be because there are a lot of things in there like that like bringing firearms on you know it's very specific as to what you have to do if you do that on campus so they also have training annually yeah so we try to reinforce it there too because right. it's become such a big but I agree issue. with um, Commissioner McLaughlin I think it's one of those things that you know, whatever we can do to help be proactive would be good. Well, Thank I think in, in the words of Jimmy Garris, my, my first time I ever met Mr. Garris, I asked him what I could do in this school district to be nice. I mean, to, to uh, <laughs> promote a better relationship. I'm jumping ahead of myself. And um, I, I was expecting a long, and he just looked at me and said, be nice. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. And I, I think that um, that's part of what we've lost in our I mean, it's it's a societal issue. It's yes. a school issue. Yes. Just the whole issue of being Respect. nice and respecting That's each right. other uh, is is a difficult is difficult. And we can't for take all, all care of all of it in the school system. I understand that. Well, we try, but I know. Thank you, okay, Mr. Smith. How many textbook manufacturers are left that makes textbook sound? Do you know? <laughs> That's, that's a good question, too. You know, a whole lot of them, I think, because states around the country have done a lot of what North Carolina is doing, yeah. have seen the writing on the wall. Yeah. We have um, all of our set textbooks we have on CD, so we can give a family a computerized version. The issue is access, and not every child has the ability to go home and put that you know, into a computer. So the textbook companies have been, when you buy that book, you also buy the online version. And we don't have limits, Mr. Smith, about 
our ability to reproduce that. It's just we have to be very careful that children have access to that. I've heard there wasn't but one left that printed textbooks. I don't know. Um, all of them see, as you said, see the handwriting on the wall is going to a computer. How many classes do we have in Pitt County, if any, that the accreditation of that class is in jeopardy because they use a too old textbook? <laughs> Well, you ask a very, very good question. We, we this year are piloting the use of a device in AP Biology. It was our first yeah. course to come up, and the College Board would not grant credit because you can't teach from a book that's more than eight years old. And our AP Biology books are 10 years old, and that book cost $200. And so we can buy a device for a little over $300. The teachers met. They all said, hey, we can download free books, um, college textbooks, and use multiple sources if the kids have the, the tool. So that's the route we went. It's a very small scale and you know not something we can do with thousands of kids yet. But you're exactly right. I mean, you do get to points of the credit becomes an issue for the course if the resources are too old. I got one more question. Yes, the pre-K testing, explain that process because I don't quite understand it. And the federal judge ruling without having an effect on Pitt County. <laughs> uh, good questions. If, if I, um, I, I would tell you that pre-K assessment is similar to low wealth, it's, it's, it's a very complicated formula. Uh, there's, an, there's an academic or cognitive assessment to see where children are. There's also intake where they look at the poverty level of a parent. And then there's also an interview that looks at the level of support that a pre-K child gets at home. If that makes sense because we know primary teachers for pre-K kids are not necessarily preschools. They're what exposures those children have at home. And there is a formula. And we have to rank order children and serve the neediest children by that formula first. And North Carolina gives us a certain number of slots. They give us money for a certain number of slots. And we rank order the children and then we fill them and and by law we have to fill the most at risk uh, serve the most at risk students first the question you raise about the courts is what is the what is the definition of at risk and i think before this gets resolved in the courts and somebody saying the state's got to come up with a lot of money they're going to have to resolve that that um formula. In Pitt County, it's not difficult for us because we typically have about a thousand children on a waiting list for pre-K. So I believe with all my heart, the 600 and some we serve are the neediest and that we could probably serve another 600 and they, they qualify as needy based on the subsidized services they get in the community. The difficulty is that we don't provide transportation. We don't have funds for transportation. So sometimes kids get accepted into a pre-K program and then they can't get to the location to be served. And so we'll go to the next child on the list. Did I answer your question? I think I do. <laughs> We've asked you a lot of questions, but I think the main concern of this board should be that we get in touch with the legislators and let them real know what a predicament the school system, not just in Pitt County, but all over the state is going to be in uh, with no textbooks. If they're going to computers, they're going to have to come up with some money or, or some other source. Well, and, you know, with, with your colleague sitting beside you, what I also hope doesn't happen is that because of court orders, we don't look at the big picture. And I'm a pre-K proponent. I believe it makes a huge difference for kids. But if we're going to come up with a big chunk of money and we still can't fund textbooks, you know, we need to look at the K-12 mandated program first, and then we look at how do we serve our pre-K kids. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Johnson. 
Yes, <clears throat> Mr. James, I'm going to be as gentle as I possibly can. <laughs> That's the reason I want to come back. The, uh, <laughs> I got you. Every right. year, every year we have uh, a day when commissioners from all over the state <laughs> go to the General Assembly and lobby. And since the textbook issue was brought uh, up by you and the, the funding with textbooks is by the General Assembly, it would be helpful if you'd go with us uh, to lobby the members that. of the General Assembly. Okay. Uh, I, I don't miss one of these, and uh, several other members of this board don't miss uh, lobbying the General Assembly, and we, we need all the help we can get. And then uh, I, I do think that uh, Dr. Emery should also mention that we we had a, a high bid on the sale of Third Street School and uh, and what how that has developed. We hope to be closing this week. Um, our board has to take uh, action next Monday night to finalize that. And um, I'm not off the top of my head going to call the exact amount. It was way more than we dreamed. The reverse bid process took a long time, but. Um, what about 280 something I think uh, and so uh, that's a good that's that's good for us we are leasing back from the property owners the warehouse that we have on that property for a year because that's where we house textbooks and we don't know what's going to happen with that and and you know whether we can house them someplace else on one of our properties and so that gives us a little time to make a decision about what we do with that but um, that was a that was a plus and you know they're already they already have a, a variety of programs and training programs that they plan to implement there so I think it's also going to be a viable and active part of the community which was one of our concerns was making sure whoever purchased it didn't just leave it sitting there doing nothing so thank you um, mr. James I'm hitting the timer boom Pass. Go. <laughs> all right the Greenleaf Foundation to buy the money Golden Leaf. Golden Leaf, yes. all right. They're the Golden Leaf Foundation then. They give a tremendous amount of money to schools and so forth. How much money have they ever given to Pitt County? Do you know, have they, have they given any? In other words, here's what I'm going to. Green County has already gone to the computers. You probably know right. that. Right. Edgecombe County is in the process of 100% going. And they got the money from this foundation. Gold Leaf. Gold Leaf. $2 million, free money. Most tobacco money came from Pitt County. Not from Edgecombe County, not from Green County, but from Pitt County. Have we asked for money from them to take and to assist us with these textbooks with the problems that we have to buy if we're gonna to go to computers? Get those computers and put the books on them. We won't have to do it at one time, will we? I mean, I don't know that much about it. Well, but am I wrong? You'd have to replace the computers over time. I, well, it's in there with Green County that they, if they don't graduate unless they turn the computer in. They don't want to ever get a diploma. <laughs> That's all I want to say. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. But I, I, I just wanted to say that to make sure that you all know there was other ways to yes. go about getting this money. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Oh, okay, up. we'll move on to our next item. Thank you, Thank you very, very much, much, Dr. Emery, for coming. Um, I will recognize Teresa Campbell with the ABC board, and she'll give us the quarterly report. If you'll come forward. Right to go forward. We're good. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Good morning. Um, I'm here today to give you a brief overview of our fiscal year 2012. Um, basically, I'm going to be giving you information on our retail sales and the distributions that we made to the county. So here on our first slide, you'll see that retail sales for fiscal year 2012 were on um, $12,622,509. Uh, an increase of one million one hundred twelve dollars two hundred fifty one hundred twelve two hundred fifty nine dollars 
and that's our increase over fiscal year 2011. Our mixed beverage sales, the total sales for fiscal year 2012 were $3,102,932, which is a $110,018 increase from fiscal year 2011. Our mixer sales, sales, we had a little bit of a decrease because I think the prices in our stores with the alcohol, 1% alcohol, are quite a bit more than what they can buy in the grocery store. So I think that's kind of where, so we're going to kind of get out of doing mixer sales as much so we won't lose that money. All right, sorry about that. Um, next slide, let's see, we want gross sales, so we're gonna have to go back. All right. Our gross sales for 2012, the total amount was um, 15,745,249, and an overall increase from the previous year was 1,215,901, which was an 8.4% increase. And I hope we can have an increase that, that good this year as well, because that helps both us and the county. Our next slide here, I have our year-to-date distribution and retention. Our uh, change in net assets, as you can see, was a million three ninety six zero seventy eight eighty three. Um, our actual distributions to the county at the end of the third quarter were eight hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. Um, fourth quarter distribution was $92,537.80, and we did an additional distribution which was taken from our working capital of $182,462.20 to make it a total for the year of $1.1 million. And if you'll note um, the figure on the bottom, the 296078.83 is what we retained um, from our profits. So, and I'd like to make a note that 79% of our profits went to the county and we retained 21%. And hopefully with the economy picking up a little bit, we'll be able to keep a little more of those profits so that we can, we can build our business up. Next is a profit distribution comparison. I just basically took our 2011 numbers and our 2012. Um, the statutory 3.5% profit di distribution was three, for 2012 was 390,363. Additional distribution from our working capital of 709,637, which brings us to the 1.1 million that we gave to the county this year. Um, the total distribution for a fiscal year 2012 with um, the beverage price support, which is the nickel penny that we pay on a monthly basis to the county, was 54927 which is added to the, the 1.1 million, 3.5% um, profit distribution. And the total distribution one was 1.154927. This thing just doesn't want to agree with me today. All right. Okay. All right, I'll just go on. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, overall, I just wanted um, to mention that we continue to increase our sales. And um, as promised, we did not do any re renovations to our stores this year, uh, and we, we or make a purchase of land. Um, it's the board's plan to start on that this fiscal year. In closed session at our last meeting, the board discussed the purchase of a land building package. The plan is to close our lease location and sell the property at our Arlington um, and combine the two into one location. This will help reduce our operating costs by consolidating and of course we'll save 33000 a year from that lease property, property that we have. Um, it's the board's plan to grow, increase revenue, and meet the needs of the citizens of Pitt County. The board plans to build additional consumer-friendly stores, remodel existing stores, 
provide additional products to satisfy customer trends, and offer additional educational services to help underage drinking. The Pitt County ABC Board and its employees are dedicated to providing control, revenue, a good selection of products that are focused towards consumers, and stores located to best serve the citizens of Pitt County while generating as much revenue as possible. Thank you all for your attention. Are there any questions? Okay, my, Mr. Smith and then Mr. James. And what do you contribute to mixed sales down in 2012 compared to 2011? What do you think? Why was it a drop? It, it, it's been dropping for the past three years, and I think, like I said, since there's um, the prices in the grocery store are much cheaper, I think that the consumers are buying in grocery stores instead of in our liquor stores. Okay, Mr. James. Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes. It looks like to me that boy's going to spend a lot of money doing all these things that you got there. Yes, sir. Well, y'all remember that now. All right. The next thing is. You had, we get, you get 21%. Uh -huh. We get 79%. Yes, sir. All right. If we put 20% and 80%, 20, uh, we get 21, yeah. While I'm trying to figure out how can we in, entice you all to make more money that you make it and we make it because we want more money. Well, the way to make more money is to invest more money, and that's why we want to take this extra money to, to build a store and combine these other two locations. Uh, let's hope so. Yes, sir. But sometimes we overspend, you know. We don't need, let me say this to you, we don't need this great big huge monster. Oh, my goodness. You know, tell how much money it costs out there, and we could have done the same thing with a lot less money. So I'm going to be looking at this building myself, and I don't want to say I told you so. Well, so let me let's, well let's let me let you know this. We plan to do this and give what we the 1.1 million dollars that we have have promised to the county for this fiscal year. Yeah, and and do this project as well. We're hoping to get more. <laughs> okay, okay. Mr. That's all I want to say. Yes. Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Ms. James, in support of of, of Ms. Campbell, I think that the board has really. Uh, 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 looked into this very thoroughly uh -huh. and um, and I agree I think that we're going to come out uh, to be substantial and an advantage uh, to uh, help the board out uh, once this new store is built we're going to close the one as she indicated on Fire Tower uh, Road yes. and uh, we, so I think it's going to be a, a great venture one of the concerns that you know I have and and and, and some people uh, may have that do you see some commissioners now that are serving on the ABC board Lynn Webb and myself are serving on the board and uh, I, I want to ask uh, the my, the attorney here uh, I'm hearing some concern out in the community that may be somewhat of a conflict I don't see it as being a conflict I see it as as a serv service and and I think somewhere I did some studies that there are many more uh, boards of commissioners who have commissioners in this state serving on the ABC board. And Madam Chair, uh, Attorney, I would ask that you, could you enlighten us on that in terms of any conflict, uh, uh, possible conflict as, as you see? Sure. Generally speaking, there's no conflict of interest. We researched that issue before the first appointment, um, and that law hasn't changed. Um, there are um, uh, other uh, examples within the state where commissioners or county staff members serve on the board. Off the top of my head, I can think of Currituck County, that's um, all commissioners on their ABC board, and I can think of New Hanover County, where they have county staff serving on their ABC board. I have also um, had discussion with Mike Kroll, who I consider to be one of the experts in this area with the School of Government, um, and there is no uh, blanket conflict for a commissioner to serve on a board. Um, I do know that there might be issues that arise that uh, 
would cause uh, a commissioner to uh, abstain from voting, and those would be those decisions that would personally affect you. For example, as a county commissioner, it would not be appropriate for you or Mr. Webb to vote on, say, a salary increase to an ABC board member, because that would benefit you personally by that, uh, by that action. But outside something um, remote like that, um, we would look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, and generally speaking, there would be no conflict. Um, that would occur and as I sit on this board with you if an issue arises where you're asked to vote and I believe that there is a conflict I'll absolutely bring that to your attention in advance and again at the time of so I'm not concerned that you will cross into any illegal territory thank you okay. mr. Johnson yes thank you um, I think this is the appropriate time for the county attorney to once again point out what state law says with regard to distribution of money to the county <coughs> sure uh, state law requires that all net profits of an ABC board be distributed to the county um, unless there's some other agreement um, and uh, we have um, worked with the ABC board over the years and we are currently operating under an agreement that there be 1.1 million dollars distributed um, to the county and they've honored that agreement um, if such time that agreements not honored or we say there is an agreement then all net profits would distribute to the county that would be though net profits after their budgeted distributions which could include um, a block of money that would be dedicated towards their working capital um, their working capital week parameters um, within which the ABC board operates and so there is um, absent an agreement to pass the 1.1 million it wouldn't be that the county would automatically receive uh, the full gross profit that was received because they have a budgeted amount that would go into their working capital fund if that working capital amount budgeted um, were at a much greater amount than it is now uh, their books could show little to no net profit um, they haven't operated that way um, and we have no reason to believe that they will so um, deserving or being legally entitled to all net profits doesn't mean you get an absolute number or you get that first number of, gr uh, of uh, gross profits because there are other budgetary considerations that could impact that number I think the county at this point given their gross profits uh, with a 1.1 million dollar agreement has almost accomplished a win-win so that the county can receive the money that it's expecting but there's still some remainder that allows them to build their working capital um, and the more aggressive they are the more quickly their working capital will build so I'm pleased that we've been able to work cooperatively to 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 be a win-win for both sides okay. thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Elliott wanted to make a comment before we move on. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I do want to report to the board that myself and Chris McDaniel did meet with Teresa and David last week to go over the, the final year in numbers and um, did talk about the land acquisition and new building. And obviously, I don't want to go into detail um, at that conversation, but other than to say that this year they did have almost $300,000 in additional net profit that went to their working capital. The new working capital maximum that an ABC board can have is 12 weeks. They've got about nine weeks right now. Their goal is still to go 12. It used to be 16, but the state has set 12 as the as a ceiling on, on working capital. In terms of um, this this package, this building they're trying to build will be different from the, in the past. They're going to be financing this package over about a five-year period. And as long as the percent in sales continue to increase, they should be able to make their debt payments on that building and, and land package together. If um, if sales were to to decrease or to to not be where they are, then might have an issue or problem meeting the 1.1 million dollars in future fiscal years. I just want to point that out. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank Ms. you. Campbell. Okay. Um, next, we have Florida Hardy and our Partners for Effective Performance Status Report. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, um, in conversations with the manager uh, a few weeks ago, we realized it had been, we've been using this tool for 10 years. And uh, we presented it to you first back in 2001. So we just thought we'd bring it up again and mention to you um, that we're still using the same tool. Um, and one of the reasons we started using what we call Partners for uh, Effective Performance, uh, fondly known to, or maybe not so fondly known to employees and supervisors as the PEP, um, is because we wanted to change our process years before we were using a tool that allowed supervisors to evaluate employees at the end of a year. 
with this particular process, we um, start out with a plan meeting with our employees, and supervisors are required to sit down with employees and actually plan their goals for the for the year. And it is based on the fiscal year, so it's in conjunction with the budget process and departmental goals. But we have a planning meeting with the employees. We set up their goals and objectives. We have a progress report in the middle of the year, and then at the end of the year, they get their score um, for this PEP. Um, and there should be no surprises because they were part of the planning process and, and the employees loved that because one of the chief complaints we had was that they were getting evaluated at the end of the process. Um, and this tool is also used when we have a performance, pay for performance system in place and employees are granted raises. So uh, it's been a successful tool, we think. Um, it started out as a paper document that we had to key into an Excel through Excel. And thanks to MIS, it is now an electronic tool so we can do it on um, um, on the computer. It's stored in the computer, and we no longer have to print out those long documents because we had pages and pages that we were printing. So our personal files were getting bigger and bigger. But now with this particular system, we can store those securely uh, electronically. Um, not everybody loves it. Not everybody hates it. But it's 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 the best we can work with, and I think it has been a successful tool for the employees. Um, one of the comments I'd like to make is that I think it was a great plan for us to do this 10 years ago and I think it still is a great plan to be in motion but it's a working document I know that numerous times you have come before us or the manager has and there have been things about it that have been tweaked and added to and changed and that sort of thing so yeah. I think that's very good but you definitely need an organized established way to evaluate Absolutely. your employees so thank you for implementing that sure. for us yes mr elliott just want to take on to the comments that the the pep system the partners for effective performance is a requirement under the the personal ordinance that you as a board have adopted the the far majority of all departments do implement this there are some departments i guess that have the option to opt out of certain parts of the personal ordinance and this would be, would be one of them but as florida had, had mentioned the the, the PEP instrument, any scores or all the scores that were derived from last year, if we had merit money, those scores would be used to implement merit money this year. So if, you know, Lord willing, we get to put merit money back in the budget next year, the scores from this year would drive those. So without a score, an employee would be unable to receive a, a merit increase because merit increase is based upon the, the pay plan, which mirrors the state pay plan that has to be um, implemented um, comprehensively and um, uniformly across all the paid classifications. So just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Motion to accept the report. Second. Okay. Let's vote. Okay. We have our items for consent. Motion to accept the uh, items for consent. And we have one item I think that we wanted to take yes. off and put. Yes, Madam Chairman. As an outcome of the agenda preview meeting last Thursday, um, some of the commissioners attending asked that number six come off the budget amendment for the sheriff's office to hear about excise tax funds and his um, get an update, uh, a, a positive report on vehicles and what we're doing with the vehicles. Okay. And will that be good for discussion or decision? You, you, however you want to do it. Well, there's no decision, discussion. so discussion. Uh, how about number 10? Okay. Where's that money coming from? That's from the Mideast Commission. Those are... Um, um, federal state dollars so and actually that's a that's a decrease over what we had projected is a fifty three thousand dollar fifty three thousand twelve dollars decrease in dollars that we thought we were going to receive the yeah. officials numbers came okay. in they were lower so okay. it's lowering the budget okay. okay we have a motion to accept and a second is that correct yeah. okay let's vote yeah, second. with that one coming off okay We'll move forward to items for discussion. And the first one, um, Mr. Garris, are you going to present or Mr. Elliott? Um, I can open it up and then turn to okay. Mr. Garris. Right. Commissioner Garris asked that we put on, on the agenda an item dealing with the inspection fee increase. As the board is aware, through the budget workshops back in May, the staff did recommend increasing the inspection fees. In terms of a cost recovery model, I'm going to call it, that we would pay for all of the cost of inspections through the, the fees that are, are, um, are assessed for that. Um, we had basically a 37% overall increase in fees. We had looked at Pitt County, benchmarked ourselves against our comparable counties, also 
gave you information about surrounding counties just as a, as a point of comparison as well. Um, we radically changed the way that we, we implement the fees to the, the new method of uh, looking at a house, for example, instead of individual fees for different components. I think a house up to X amount of square feet would be charged one base rate, then above it another base rate. Two things that came out of that from um, as a result of it, one was dealing with the reinspection fees and the staff had recommended changing the reinspection fee from the old fee of $50 to $150. The other um, fee that was has been questioned is the single pole fee when you put an electrical pole in for a site went from $50 to $100. And um, Commissioner Garrison, I want to steal your thunder if you want to. I can stop there and let you. Okay, I will, I will take over. What uh, precipitated this? Uh, first of all, let me say I appreciate the work that our planning department and staff has did on developing this fee structure because they were following our instructions as to uh, recoup the cost of the planning department. And uh, I think that uh, they did a very good job in doing that. <coughs> On an average, I think they accomplished that. But if you look at some of the individual fees, some of them went up considerably. And I have had uh, an electrician, uh, an electrical contractor to discuss this with me at length on several occasions and uh, I have met with uh, Scott and James on two occasions one of those occasions the electrical contractor was there and what uh, I have decided to do uh, he had several issues but these were the two prevalent issues that I felt comfortable in bringing to this board so I would like to make a motion to go on and put this on the table for discussion Scott has already explained the differences in the fees but the two fees that I want to propose that we change is number one, the temporary poll fee that was $50 last year and went up to $100 in this year's budget. My motion is that we put that back to $50. The second part of my motion is in the reinspection fee, which was $50 last year. It went up to $150 in this year's budget. My motion is that we make that $75. And the third part of my motion is that we make both of these fees retroactive back to the beginning of our budget, which was uh, July the 1st. Uh, that is my motion. And uh, we second. can. I've got a second. So now uh, we can have whatever um, discussion you would discussion. like to have. Yes. Okay, want, uh, Mr. James and Mr. Owens. We instructed the planning department to recoup what money they would spend, what it cost the taxpayers of Pitt County to take and to do this inspection job. I went to the manager, to James, and because I was very much, primarily to James, I was very much concerned with how much it went up. And they assured me, Mr. James, we even at this figure are not going to make any money. And what we're going to do here is come back now and tell them, and I'm a firm believer, if I, and I've just paid it too, but that if it comes down to what it costs, we'll be willing to pay it. He's not going to pay it. He's going to get it from the other people. You know it and I know it. It's a pass on a path, but somebody has got to pay it, and I don't think the taxpayers ought to be the one, because if we take this off, we're going to have to add somewhere else to it. That's all I got to say. Okay. Mr. Owens. I'm glad that it came back up before. I've, I've raised some questions at our budget discussions about this. Anytime you've got a 100 or 150% increase in the cost of operation of something from the prior year, I have a big question. I had one then. I think there were some calculations that were over reviewed. I think so now, and I'm in favor of this. As a second amendment to that, I think, Scott, you and your staff need to look at the others that increased to that considerable amount. You, you look at the, the economy as it's down. You, you've got for building a house, Jimmy Garrish, you've got to have an engineer, you've got to have an architect, you've got to have this. The inspections are already there. We have not hired more inspectors, I don't think, with, with, with the buildings down. No. And I just did not see then and do not see now no need arguing over it now. I lost that argument then, but I'm, I'm in favor of this vote. Okay. Um, Mr. Garris? Madam Chairman, uh, 
let me respond to Commissioner James. I understand your point. I, I really do. Yeah. Uh, and I do have some reservations, and I explained this to the contractor about changing our budget two months into the year. That's right. However, when I looked at these two issues, the temp pole fee and the reinspection fee, I felt like that they were of a valid concern. Again, if you look at page 82 in our agenda package, and James did, did this for us, if you look at the reinspection fee in that first column from our comparative counties and surrounding counties, the average for that fee is $55.79. And I was currently is 150 in this year's budget. Uh, I'm again my motion says that we need to take that to 75 which is still a $25 increase over the $50 from last year if you look at the temp poll fee from our surrounding counties and comparative counties that average is $45.75 so if you look at those uh, that comparison we are significantly higher uh, than our surrounding counties and comparable counties so, on the, on the temp pole fee, uh, my our recommendation there is that we take that back to 50, which is still $5 higher than the average. Again, I understand the point that they were developing these fees to recoup the cost, and I understand that and support that. But on these two fees, I think they are uh, <coughs> pretty excessive, and I stand by my motion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, I, I have an amendment. I, I would propose as an amendment that that none of these changes be retroactive. Okay. <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, <coughs> any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. McLaughlin? Yeah. I, well, I think Jimmy uh, has a, a valid uh, recommendation. I do think that uh, we had set our budget reflecting uh, the amount of money that was uh, was mentioned to the public, and we voted on that budget. However, after looking at the uh, comparison, the reduction of monies that uh, the comparative counties uh, is, is charging as compared to what we're charging, I can see uh, that, that that is being relatively high. And I'm 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 in, I'm in leaning towards uh, supporting that, but as Commissioner Johnson just pointed out, not to make it retroactive. Okay, um, we vote. Excuse me. To, I want to talk to James. Come up here, James. I did this. The, the, I'm not buying this. All right, James. Overhaul. They're taking these two, just two things, aren't they? Just two things. That's right. Out of the budget now. How about overall for our inspection? How do we stand for those? We're only two months into the budget, yes. and we're tracking right on schedule to recoup the cost. Scott and I have talked about this. We're at the summertime. We're going to get a lot more permitting activity than we will in December and January. So right now, we're up just a tad. If we go through our regular cycle, we'll be right at the amount based on the first two months for the to cover our expenses and inspections and permitting. What I'm saying, are we going to make money or lose money? You're saying we're going to break, it's just I we'll say we we'll break we'll even. We we'll break even. That's as right, as the fee schedule is established without these amendments? Or yes. Okay. Currently tracking. It's like we're doing now. Yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner I'm James. I'll be the only one, but I'll do it. In the agenda package, I had made a counter recommendation to what um, Vice Mayor, Chairman Garris is, is suggesting on the reinspection, I said yes, go down to seventy-five dollars for the first reinspection, but every reinspection thereafter, a hundred dollars. Because yeah. they're gonna have more. That's the right. That's only difference I think between what's on the table. Okay. Any other comments? I want to respond to James for Mr. James. Okay. Yeah. The fallacy of this is the cost that James is talking about. He's tracking the cost of this. That's where I have a problem with the Eugene. Thank you. Okay. But uh, that's what I'm um, We bill. vote on the substitute motion substitute first, motion first which, is which is to amend the fees um, 
as Mr. Garris stated, but to make those um, not retroactive, so effective October 1st. October 1st. Starting October the 1st with the new fee changes if it passes. Okay. Um, so we're ready to vote on the substitute motion. Everyone understand? Okay. Let's vote, please. Okay. Thank you. So we don't need to go to the other motion. All right. Thank you very much. And our next item for discussion is um, the sheriff. Uh, sheriff Elks, if you'll come up. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. You want to direct me exactly what you'd like me to report on? Because the agenda item says uh, we request and receive the excise tax of 6,000 Okay, I'm getting Mr. Elliott to restate what he stated before sure. for all of us to hear better. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Sheriff Elks, the discussion and agenda preview last Thursday, I think was around the, um, the state, state excise tax or other type of taxes you receive that are specifically um, designated for law enforcement purposes. I think yes. the board members who attended wanted to hear a report on maybe what vehicles you've bought in addition to the vehicles that were in the budget for July sure. 1. So they have an idea of, I think we bought about a dozen new vehicles out of the general fund, and then you have purchased maybe a like amount out of these um, designated funds. Okay. Let me just give us an overall sight of what we did. We've purchased uh, 13 cars with the amount of money that y'all gave us during the budget. Um, and that total package of equipping the cars and marking the cars worked out to be about $384,388. Of that, $20,000 come from our budget. Uh, that would be the um, asset forfeiture money. Um, and just the, to add. The forfeiture money? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we purchased $164,488 in cars uh, outside of that budget item um, that was f purchased with asset forfeiture money as well. We presently have a balance of $16,780 in the state excise tax forfeiture money and in the federal we have uh, $56,921. And also, since the last budget, you know, there's a lot of talk in the last budget hearing about guns. We also spent $5,000 of that money as well to buy guns with and ammo. Okay. Um, so, uh, of the 164, how many cars did you buy with that? Six. Six. So, you have added 19 cars? Correct. Okay. Good. I, I, I think that it's important for us to inform the public about that because there was so much discussion about uh, cars during the budget time and I think this is uh, very good. I commend you and your organization for taking some of this forfeiture money and buying six additional cars and uh, hopefully as you get more of that money we can buy more cars. Well we've been very aggressive in trying to make sure we uh, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that's there for us to seize and, um, and the state reward us with the forfeiture money. But just to give you an overall where we're at on cars, we have a total of 185 cars in our fleet um, and we're going to turn in 16 vehicles to be turned in for sale back to the county. Um, this morning alone I received two phone calls of additional vehicles down, one was a transmission out with 180,000 miles on it. We're going to probably shift that around and uh, see if we can find a car maybe in a little bit better shape than that. And, and also another car is down this morning. We don't know what's wrong with that one yet. But uh, we still have approximately 30 cars that are in desperate need right now. Um, so if any time you guys will come up with some extra money, $200,000 will carry us a long way. We got a couple ID vehicles that are out. They're next on the radar to replace whether we come up with the money or you can come up with some money for us. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Owens? How, how about your federal Mr. Prison? Owens and then Mr. Jones. I think the sheriff and, and whoever's in his staff doing this is doing exactly what they ought to do. They're using this restricted money to buy cars to try to help the taxpayers. And I commend you for that, Sheriff. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. James. How many federal prisoners are you on the average you're keeping now? Well, the average federal count's down right now. We're averaging about... Um, Somewhere between 68 and 75. Yes, down there. But I'm um, very concerned about our jail population. Uh, our jail population is um, close to 550. We're probably 60 over capacity. So that's something we need to be keeping on our radar screen. Do we need to 
look at opening up the um, new addition. We know that's about eight hundred thousand dollar cost. Um, it's hard to push to get our federal count up right now. We're still over capacity, so um, we have to look at that. But the federal prisons are all down across the state right now. The population of them. Do are we down. need to talk to some judges or anything, deal that? Uh you know, we've well, the biggest thing, I couldn't house them if I had them. If I had 30 extra right now, I'd be busting at the seams, and we're yeah. busting at the seams right now. So our overage right now is kind of working out to balance the thing because we're over, but we're also down on jail population. If we had a 30 extra inmates right now, we'd be looking at, you know, close to 600 prisoners. We'd be yeah. way over capacity. You know, we do have the additional wing we can open, but like I said, that's $800,000 just for to uh, open that up. So I and the manager are aware of the numbers. We need to be conscious of what the future holds in the next couple of months. If, we, if that population number continues, we need to sit and talk it, talk about it, and see what we can do. Right now, the jail tells me they're comfortable and they can't operate. They generally predict the population will go down in the next couple of months. It's on the average it has. Mr. Hammond. Yes, uh, sure. As you transition from Crown Vic, what are you going to? Uh, we've got some, um, well, we're going to Chargers is what we're purchasing for the patrol. Oh, the Chargers. Yeah, and we bought some undercover vehicles as well. Madam Chair, you want a motion on six or you already have it? I don't we think we need them. Uh, well, we, Budget we probably have yeah. to accept it, yes. Right? Yes. Because we took it off the consent. I have some moves. Second. Second. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's vote. Okay, um, I put down the resolution for approving the financing terms uh, for items for decision. Our first one, do I hear a motion so that moved. we accept this resolution? So okay. moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? I can just make a note the um, North Carolina Local Government Commission will be hearing this matter tomorrow. It's been scheduled on their agenda. That's why it is needed for um, part of their approval process. Okay, thank you. One question. Yes, sir. What, what is the difference from this and what we passed last time, Scott? No difference at all. All the terms and conditions are the same. The only, the only thing the resolution does is authorizes myself and the staff to execute the documents to go to closing. We didn't do that last time? No. No. And if I can clarify, the last resolution was with Bank of America. Then at your last meeting, the board approved the change to Siemens, but we did not have the accompanying resolution with it. So this is the resolution. Did you have to pay Bank of America any money to get them out of No, sir. They actually pulled out. Because of oh, that's all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Owens, if you'll finish voting. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, okay, our next item, uh, Dr. Morrow. The uh, a budget amendment for the health department. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Mm -hmm. I've uh, come this morning to ask for debt uh, right off of our bad debt for the last three and a half years. It was February of 2009, the last time that the uh, health department wrote off the bad debt. Um, so it's been quite a while, but uh, we took this to uh, your uh, Board of Health last month and approved a write off of $206,518.32 going back to February of 2009. Uh, that's a, about uh, a little less than $60,000 per year on average and represents 1800, over 1,800 accounts. Uh, these um, uh, accounts have cycled twice through the North Carolina Debt Set-Off Program, so anyone who comes in for service, who uh, who pays taxes, or uh, you know wins in the North Carolina lottery, anything like that would get collected on. So they've been through two cycles of that without collections. We've been mailing all this time uh, bills um, and not not getting any response. So. Uh, and this is something we've done in the past. We we do it. We've had to do yes. Yes, ma'am. We do it every few Thank years. Thank you. So. Any comments? Dr. Johnson. I would move that uh, we uh, write off this bad debt. Okay. Is All there right. a second? Se second. Okay. The motion's been made in seconding. Comments? One, one Garris, comment for the public. We have done everything we can do to collect this money. 
and we cannot collect it. That's correct. Eric. That is and, correct. And I, I, I would just clarify too that we work very uh, uh, well with with our clients, and and if there's any way that we can work out a payment plan, we're always willing to do that before we get to this phase. Of okay. So we've set this file against the North Carolina debt set-off program, where if you get an income tax return, so we've we've gone to every extreme that we can. Yes, Mr. Owens uh, first, and then you, Mr. Oh, yeah. Long. Other than the write-off, we all know what that understands, yes, what that means, Doc. But this just clears your records, is that correct? That's correct. So if at any time, I, I would just clarify, at, at any time should these patients come back to the health department for services, then these accounts will come back alive, too. So we'll try to collect that money as soon as we see them. Mr. McClellan? Yes, sir. Um, uh, most of these patients, uh, well, you probably don't know, but... Uh, are they indigent? Uh, are they can uh, can they be located? Is some that just can't be located because they maybe move out of town? A fictitious name or all of the above? All of the above. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Let's vote, please, on the motion. Mr. Hammond. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. And we have uh, from the Department of Social Services. I didn't see you sitting. <laughs> okay, thank you. And we're here today to ask permission to upgrade our staff returning from 80% to 100% and our child support enforcement unit. The workload has increased and she is required to work overtime as well as be on call when our child protective service workers work. So we need her to be available to do the work that needed. And she's currently working 32 hours per week, but we need that to go to 40 hours per week. I think it's important that funds are available within the revenue stream. I so move, Madam Chairman. Second. Okay. Um, Mr. Garris? Uh, my comment was going to be that the funds are included in the budget. Yes. Therefore, I was going to make a motion, but the motion has already been made. If it hasn't been seconded, I'll second it. Okay. Yes. And let's vote. Okay. And our next item is the... Manning Family Cemetery Relocation. Ms. Gallagher? Yes, and I'll turn this over to Justin <coughs> Smith if um, he is in the back of the room with the family members. This is a cemetery that's located in um, the unincorporated part of Pitt County. The family members have all gotten together. They've retained Mr. Smith from Smith Funeral Services to move it. He has worked with me from the beginning of this project. He has complied with all of the procedural requirements in terms of genealogy research, public notice, and has uh, received uh, written consents from all of the family members, and they have documented everything very well. So um, he is here if you have questions for him. I don't know if he intended a presentation, but this board would require uh, your permission for him to uh, move this at no cost to the county. Um, at all, and you've done these before. Yes, we've done these before, Mr. Smith. So I would make a motion second. that we approve the resolution. Okay. Second. All right. Any discussion? Nice seeing you. Nice having <laughs> you, you with us, good. and thank you for doing a good job. Appreciate in it. In preparing it was really nice. <laughs> Mrs. Gallagher, she was very helpful in the process. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that. And if I may, too, just so that you know, the family members and and heirs of those in that cemetery have all been present this morning. Good. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This. Okay, um, next are our appointments, Mr. Elliott. Yes, on the item number four yeah. appointments to the Pitt County Nursing Home Adult Care Community Advisory Committee for a recommendation from the Commission for the appointment of Renetta Williams to an initial one year term on that board. I so move to approve. Second. Okay, let's vote. <coughs> and then we have a reappointment to the Simpson Planning Board. Yes, that's Robert D. Enderez for a two year appointment that would expire August 2nd, 2014. Again, reappointment. Motion yes, to approve. Second. Any discussion? Let's vote, please. Oh. Okay. Um, that passes. Uh, next, we have our commissioner's comments. We'll start with you, uh, Mr. Beck. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just one quick one. Make the board aware that the uh, 
town of Aden is being nationally recognized as one of the best places in the U.S. to raise a family, and they'll be featured in a 30-minute documentary that'll air on Discovery Channel, I believe the early part of next year. It's called Viewpoints with Terry Bradshaw, the former NFL quarterback. So we're very proud of that in Pitt County. That's all I know. And they also were in State Magazine. Yes, Just for the college festival, and that went off. That went very well. Yes, and uh, some of us attended that over the weekend. Okay, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my colleague, Commissioner Hammond, brought up a, a very valid point in terms of uh, what the, bene the benevolent corp uh, corporation is doing on black-on-black -black crime. We have in the audience Mr. Keith Cooper, who is the uh, chairman of that benevolence corp. Corporation, Madam Chair, if if it would be the permission of the commissioner to allow him to come just for a minute to uh, elaborate as to what's going on on this uh, uh, black on black uh, crime workshop, if it's okay with you for a minute. For a minute. Okay, one minute. Ms. Cooper, where are you, Keith? Because we don't usually do that at commissioner's comments because we're right at a journey. Very quickly, thank you, <laughs> thank you Commissioner McLaughlin. But right now, uh, uh, basically what we're doing is we, we are focusing on a door-to-door -door campaign where we're going around to the various neighborhoods uh, and we're reaching out to people. We're uh, taking resources. Uh, we're working with various organizations like the Real Crisis Center, uh, Building Hope, various other, other uh, local organizations. And we're trying to reach these troubled families so we can uh, get the assistance that they, that they need uh, to help break the cycle of violence or where, where this may be an issue. Uh, as was uh, stated earlier, uh, on uh, October 6th at the West Greenville Gym, 12 noon, Saturday, October 6th, we're going to have a, uh, a Stop the Violence Unity March. <clears throat> we appreciate the support. I gave uh, Commissioner Hammond, I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned I was a little late. Uh, a, I'm waiting to a, right uh, now. No, I'm talking about a resolution. Yes, but, sir. But uh, we'll get into that some other time. <laughs> but, uh, Thank you very much. We'll we'll deal with the resolution at a later time because we're into Commissioner's comments and it's not been put on the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Uh, just quickly, I'd like to express appreciation to all the county employees. Uh, most em county employees are doing more with less money and this board appreciates it. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner no Okay, Commissioner no, Smith, no Commissioner no James, Commissioner Hammond. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, I have been asked to ask this board to support a resolution relative to uh, awareness on black on black violence and homicide. And I'm glad now that. At w my district has been expanded where, whereby it is reflective of the fact that not all of the crime is being committed in West Greenville. I represent West Greenville since 1998 and there was a time that 90 plus percent of all of the uh, in-city crime was committed, was, was being, uh, was happening in my district. But now, it, since our a, a city has grown, and all it's all over the city, and uh, I'm glad that it's reflective of that. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Cooper and the Benevolent Corps for joining in with the Neighbors uh, uh, Against Violence uh, to bring the awareness out that black violence is, is, is in, in the hood and also all over the city, murders and all. When former Commissioner Royal and I was here, seemed like every other week during the summer months, he was contacting me relative to a family that <coughs> had approached his church family about assistance with finances to help buried somebody who had been killed or had lost their life relative to this issue. And this march uh, that's going to be held 
first Saturday in October at 12 noon is to bring more awareness to this issue. Our sheriff and many civil rights organizations and ministers are in support of of the aware of making this more aware to the community and to ask them to join in with their assistance to help prevent or eradicate as much as we can this violence and these murders that are being committed in our neighborhoods by our, by our children and by our families and what have you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time to come by the center to sit down to share this with me. And I hope and, so, and pray that when the resolution come, we only have, we only had one meeting in this, in, in this September. We'll meet October 1st and 15th, so we can bring it back to the but 1st. But we'll be meeting October the 1st and October the 15th, and maybe we can get that calendarized and on the agenda to talk about it more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Owens? Only I commend anyone and everyone that wants to fight crime. I think it's a commendable thing to do for all society, and I moved it with adjourn. Okay. All right. Let's vote to adjourn. <coughs> <laughs> Mr. James, you need to hit your button again. Didn't I hit it? Oh. Mr. Abel. Mr. Abel.